Today's top story takes a sudden, wild detour that you will not see coming. Honestly, I'm shocked it's taken me until now to cover this one. But before we get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please point at the like button shirt and tell them they have something on it. When they look down, flick them in the nose. Also, please subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. While he was in college at Carnegie Mellon University, Aaron Ralston studied mechanical engineering, French, and piano, and then upon graduation, he moved to the Southwest and took a job as an engineer. But five years into his corporate job, he realized he hated it, and so he quit and moved to Colorado to pursue his real passion in life, which was mountain climbing. On April 25th, 2003, Ralston takes a trip to Utah, where he plans to explore the Canyonlands National Park. He slept in his truck that night, and the next morning at about 9.15 a.m., he gets up, and it's this beautiful Saturday morning. He hops on his bike, and he bikes 15 miles to Blue John Canyon. The canyon was an 11-mile gorge that at certain places was as narrow as three feet across. And so Aaron locks up his bike, and he begins walking through this canyon. About six hours later, at 2.45 p.m., Aaron is right at the section of the gorge that's getting really, really narrow, and below him is about 100 feet down to the bottom of the desert floor. He was going to walk with both feet on either wall because it was so narrow and kind of Spider-Man his way through the section of the canyon. But as he began that maneuver, a huge 800-pound boulder became dislodged above him, and it comes tumbling down, and he barely gets out of the way, but it lands on his arm, and it pins his arm against the wall, and he can't move, and he's suspended 100 feet off the ground, and he's 20 miles away from the nearest paved road. Immediately, he tries to pull his hand free and push the rock off, but it's not going anywhere. And that's when it dawns on him that he didn't tell anybody he was going to be in this gorge today. No one knows he's here, and he's so far away from anyone that can help him, and he doesn't have a cell phone, he doesn't have a radio, he's got no way to communicate with anyone who could potentially help him. Now, the position he was in was not him dangling by his arm 100 feet off the ground. He was able to position himself against the rocks where he wasn't dangling he was able to sit fairly comfortably besides his arm being crushed and he was able to use the rock that actually had pinned him there as a sort of table or something to lean up against and after he calms down a little bit after a few minutes he reaches back and he pulls his bag out in front and he starts taking inventory of what he has and all he had was 12 ounces of water so just a single water bottle and he had two burritos and some candy bar crumbs that was all he had in terms of tools all he had was this crummy multi-tool and it did have a little knife that extended off the end. And almost immediately, he takes that multi-tool and begins chopping away at this boulder to try to see if he can maybe crack it and push half of it off. But he's finding out very quickly that it's completely futile. It is not moving. It is an enormous boulder. It's not going anywhere. He cannot possibly break it with this crappy little multi-tool. As the sun began to set, Aaron started thinking really seriously about trying to cut his arm off. But again, all he has is this multi-tool and this crappy little dull knife. And he's thinking, there's no way I can cut through my arm. There's bone in there. I can't possibly saw through the bone. And so very disheartened, he puts his multi-tool away and he begins to nurse the water and slowly eat the food and thinks maybe some miracle will happen where over the next couple of days someone will be within earshot I can yell to them and they can come get me or maybe someone will see me when they're hiking overhead I can just wait it out but by the fifth day he had run out of water he was becoming delirious he was actually drinking his own urine at this point and he expected to die overnight and so with his multi-tool he etched his name into the rock and then underneath it he etched the date he expected to die which was the next day and then after that he put his multi-tool down and he did have a camera with limited battery and he pulled that out and selfie style he filmed goodbyes to his family my name's Aaron Ralston uh, my parents are down on Larry Ralston in Inglewood, Colorado whoever finds this please make an attempt to get it to them be sure of it I would appreciate it 
was done filming, he put the camera away and he leaned up against the rock and fully expected to die. But he starts to have this really intense dream where he sees himself playing with a child and he's missing his right arm. And he takes that as a sign that he's supposed to chop his arm off and get out of here alive and go start a family. And so he wakes up from this dream and suddenly all he wants to do is survive. And he looks at his arm, which is already starting to decompose at this point, and he thinks to himself, I know I can't cut through bone, but what if I'm able to break my arm clean through, I can take this blade and cut through the break in the bone. And so he began testing using the edge of the rock as a fulcrum to see if he'd be able to break his arm using the torque of pushing it over the edge of the rock. And when he started to sense it was possible, he took a deep breath and then he broke his arm, takes his multi-tool, and over the next hour, he would painstakingly saw through his entire arm. Once his arm was free, he couldn't believe it. He actually smiled when he saw his arm still pinned underneath the rock because of his sheer will to live at this point. And high on adrenaline, he climbed the 65 feet out of this canyon with his one arm. He gets to the trail and he runs six miles and he happens to run into a group of hikers. They give him food and water and they're totally alarmed by him, but they're happy to help him. They call 911 and Medics arrive and they save Aaron's life. Following Aaron Ralston's rescue, they went back to retrieve his arm. But in order to move that boulder, they had to bring out 13 park rangers, a hydraulic jack, and a winch, and all this heavy equipment. And they were barely able to move it. And they told Aaron, had you still been in place, there's no way we could have placed the equipment without killing you. So basically, you had to cut your arm off in order to get out of there. There was no other way out. And so for Aaron, I'm sure that felt pretty good to feel like you cut your arm off and that was the right decision. They would take his arm and they would cremate it and give the ashes to Aaron. And Aaron, after having his cremated arm for a couple of days, decided, no, I need to put this where it belongs. And so Aaron went back out to the canyon where he had been trapped and he scattered his ashes over the boulder that had nearly killed him. In 2010, Aaron's ordeal was turned into a huge blockbuster movie called 127 Hours, where James Franco plays Aaron Ralston in the movie. And it's an incredible movie, albeit it's pretty hard to watch. Aaron Ralston himself said the movie, although it's a drama, is pretty much a documentary because James Franco does an incredible job portraying his emotions and what it was actually like to be trapped underneath this boulder for five days. In 1984, 19-year-old Timothy Molnar was living at home with his parents in Daytona Beach, Florida, while going to school for aeronautical mathematics. On January 24th, Timothy gets up and begins his day just like every other day of the work week, by going downstairs, having a bite to eat, and then taking his younger brother Frank to school. Once he dropped Frank off, he drove across town to his university where he had class, but as soon as he parked, he realized he had forgotten his bike, and that was something he brought with him everywhere, and so before class started, he went back home. He got his bike, put it in his car, turned around and headed out. And his mother would step outside and see him trailing away down the road. And that was the last time she or anybody in their family, for that matter, saw him alive. That night when Tim didn't come home, his family called the police. The police asked them, you know, is there any reason he would want to run away? Is he in trouble? Is there anything going on? And his family's like, no, he's a straight A student. He's got lots of friends. He's super happy. He's well adjusted. He's on a great career path. There's nothing in his life to indicate that he would want to run away or that he's in trouble. I know he doesn't drink or do drugs. There's really nothing. So the police begin their investigation and they start by looking at the family's credit card bills because they knew Tim had a credit card that was connected to the family account. And they found there had been a charge placed the same day he had gone missing in a gas station about 150 miles away. And so the police go out to this gas station and they find someone that had been there when Tim was there. And he was able to describe exactly what he looked like, what his car looked like and the police ask him you know was Tim alone and the witness says yeah he was alone he was acting totally normal I saw him go into the store and then I saw him come back out again and that was it I don't know where he went after the gas station so for the next couple of days nothing really happened there were no leads to operate on and Tim wasn't getting in touch with them so they just waited then on January 30th so about a week after Tim has gone missing Tim's family receives a letter from an auto impound company in Atlanta Georgia and the letter basically says there is a car that's sitting in our lot that is registered to your house. You need to come out here and get it. And so the family goes to Atlanta, Georgia to inspect the car and they walk up to it and there's nothing suspicious about it. There's no scratches on it. The tires are all fully inflated. They look inside and there's there's no sign of a struggle. There's no blood. There's no debris of any kind. But what they would find inside the car were Tim's credit cards, his wallet, his license, and other 
other items suggesting that perhaps Tim is trying to ditch his old identity and start a new one. They also noticed a few very expensive items that they knew were always in his car were now missing. His car stereo, his toolbox, and his bike. Tim's family stayed in Atlanta for a couple of days thinking maybe Tim will return to this car, but after a couple of days it was clear that they weren't doing any good sitting there, so they went back to Florida. When they got back, they looked inside of Tim's room a little bit more closely and they discovered that none of his clothes had been taken. There was no suitcase taken. It was like he left with just the clothes on his back. They also checked his savings account and he had taken all the money out but left $10 in there. And the family believed that by leaving that $10, what he was really saying is, I'm going to come back someday. But he didn't come back and they never ever heard about him again. It was like he just vanished. A decade after Tim went missing, the TV show Unsolved Mysteries aired a segment about Timothy and his disappearance in hopes that the viewers would be able to give them some information about the case. And sure enough, a man named Stephen Cull, who was living in Wisconsin, called into the show and said, without a doubt, I know where Timothy is. He told them the story about how 10 years earlier, he was walking around this forested area in Wisconsin when he came to a clearing in the middle of this forest, and he saw this lump in the middle of the ground. He didn't know what it was. It was winter time, so he couldn't tell if it was wood or an animal, and he walked up to it, and he looked down, and he realized it was this huge block of ice. And when he brushed the snow off the top, he couldn't believe what he was seeing. Inside of this huge block of ice is the dead body of a young man. Cull would immediately call the police, who would show up, they would get the body out of the ice, but there was no identifying information on him, and he was very badly decomposed at this point, and so they had no way to identify him, and so he was buried, and he was unclaimed. But from the second Steve saw that dead body in the ice, that image was seared into his mind. And so when the TV show Unsolved Mysteries put a picture of Tim up on the screen saying, if you've seen this guy, let us know, Steven's like, oh my gosh, I recognize those clothes. That's the guy who was dead in the ice block. And so the police go to Wisconsin, they dig up the body that was inside of the ice, they do a DNA test, and sure enough, it's Tim Molnar. Even though Tim's body was almost completely skeletonized at this point, the coroner said there's no sign of trauma to his body. None. However, they weren't able to determine a cause of death. To this day, we have no idea how or why Tim wound up 1,200 miles away, frozen inside of a block of ice. In 2009, 25-year-old Larry Mario Moncada graduated from college and moved back in with his parents in Iowa. He was excited about his future and his parents were extremely proud of him. As soon as Larry moved back home, the first thing he did was go out and get a placeholder job at the No Frills supermarket, which was a local supermarket right in town. He figured, you know what, it's temporary, but I don't wanna just sit around all day. I wanna do that until I find my career. But even though the job was supposed to be temporary, he found that he kind of loved the job because he loved the people he worked with and his co-workers would later say that they loved working with him too. But everything in Larry and his family's life would get turned completely upside down in November of 2009. On November 26th, while a blizzard raged outside, Larry and his family celebrated Thanksgiving inside. After everyone was done eating, Larry told them that he actually had an overnight shift at the supermarket. And I don't think his family knew he had this shift. So they were like, oh man, do you really gotta go? The weather's so bad. And he's like, no, I to go. I don't mind. And they're like, all right, well, hey, sorry to go to work. And Larry walks outside and goes to work. The next morning when he came back from that shift, his mother would say something seemed off about him. When he came inside, he was very disoriented. He didn't really know where he was. And his mom's trying to tell him that everything's okay. You know, what's going on? Did something happen out there? And this is when it dawned on her that he could be having an anxiety attack. Just a few years earlier, Larry had had a whole bunch of panic attacks and he was really struggling with anxiety. And it wasn't until his mom made him go to the doctor and put him on medication that he stabilized. But at this moment, she didn't know if her son was on any medication or not. So just to play it safe, she said, hey, let's go to the doctor and have you looked at. You don't seem well. So she brings him to the doctor and the doctor quickly prescribes Larry an antidepressant. They go and fill the prescription. They go back home and Larry takes one of these antidepressants. But the medication didn't seem to be doing anything because over the course of the day, Larry got progressively more and more stressed out and more confused seeming. And eventually he told his mom that he was hearing voices in his head 
that were telling him his heart is beating too quickly and he needs to eat sugar to slow down his heart. And his mom is looking at him thinking, what do I do about this? And so all she could think to do was just to stand next to him and kind of comfort him as he sits there eating sugar over the course of the day. Finally that night he would fall asleep and his mother prayed that over the course of the night that somehow this medication he had been prescribed would kick in and he would wake up and feel better because so far it really seemed to only be getting exponentially worse. But the next morning when Larry got up he was just as bad as the night before except now he was having these vivid hallucinations. He said there were people in the house that were looking for him and so he spent the day running around the house hiding from people in the house that were not actually there. Then finally that night Larry just kind of loses it and begins screaming at his parents and berating them before suddenly running out the front door without shoes, without a jacket, no wallet, no cell phone, no anything. And he just runs directly into the blizzard and disappears. His family was so caught off guard by this happening that it took them a minute to get out the front door after him, but it was snowing so hard they could barely see in front of their face and they knew he was gone. So immediately they call the police, but the police have the same issue. They can't really go looking for him right now because the visibility was so, so bad. And so they told his family that we can't really start until tomorrow morning, so hopefully he turns up tonight. So the next day when the weather clears up a little bit, the police go out looking for Larry and they're asking people in town if they've seen him and no one's seen Larry. And unfortunately, because it had snowed so much the night before, any of Larry's tracks leading out of Larry's house were now covered over. And so after a couple of days of this, when there's just no sign of this guy, the police say to the family, look, you know, there's not much we can do. We're just going to have to wait to see if he turns up. Ten years later, the No Frills supermarket where Larry used to work was out of business and it was about to get torn down and some contractors were sent in to start ripping down the shelving and breaking down the inside of the building. And when they went into the back and began pulling away those huge freezers that keep your milk and your dairy products in, they start pulling those away from the wall. Larry's body comes tumbling out. It had been pinned in this tiny 18 inch wide space between the back of the freezer and the wall. It's believed on the night Larry ran out of his parents' house barefoot into a blizzard, he ran right up the road and went to the No Frills supermarket. Now, it was closed at the time, but he had access to the back door with the key code because he worked there. And so he went inside and he climbed on top of the freezers, the section of the freezers that jut back into the space that no one in the store can see. And he climbed on top because on top of there, all the workers would kind of congregate up there. It was like a little clubhouse where the workers would avoid the managers for little pockets of the day. And so Larry probably climbed up there because it represented a really happy place for him. And when he got up there, he must have somehow tripped and fallen into the tiny 18 inch space between the freezer and the wall. Investigators believe there's no way he actually got hurt when he fell into this little space. He got wedged in there, but he wasn't harmed. The problem was these huge fans that run constantly to keep the freezer cold were unbelievably loud and would have completely drowned out his cries for help. And so no one knows for sure how long this took, but eventually he would die because no one heard him. Looking back at old Facebook posts around the time that Larry would have been dead behind the freezer, there was a whole bunch of people that were commenting on Facebook that they didn't want to shop at the No Frills supermarket anymore. Apparently there was a really bad smell coming out of the back freezer. So that's going to do it guys. If you found the secret in today's video, in the comments section tell us what it is and at what time we can find it and the first person to do that will get pinned at the top of the comment section. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please point at the like button's chest and tell them they have something on their shirt, and then when they look down, flick them in the nose. Also, please subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is the same. It's just John Ballin 416 I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit. It's just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.